In this video, we're going to look at the Gibbs phase rule. The Gibbs phase rule defines the number of independent parameters that you can vary in a system without disturbing the phase equilibrium. So for example, let's look at a system that has a certain number of phases, we'll call the total number of phases here P, and the system has a certain number of components, C. Now, when we talk about components, which what I mean when I use that word is chemically identifiable unique components. So think about a gas mixture, right? If you have a gas mixture of O2 and uh, CO2, those will be two unique components. You would only have one phase present, right? Because it will be a mixture of both gases, right? But it will be two components, two different chemical entities, right? Or let's say, for example, you have some mixture of different solvents, right? Um, but one of them is being, uh, you know, heated up to a vapor phase or something like that. You'll have two phases, but you'll have two identifiable chemical components, right? So the Gibbs phase rule is a very simple equation where if you want to know the number of independent parameters, right? So this is, uh, this F is the number of independent parameters. Well, all you have to do is take the number of components minus the number of phases plus two right? Very simple equation. Now, the derivation of this equation is often referred to as one of the most elegant derivations, elegant arguments in thermodynamics. So I want to take you a bit through uh, Gibbs's original thought of how you arrive at this equation for um, a very simple equation for the number of independent parameters that you can vary without disturbing uh, the equilibrium, right? So first, let's think about how many total ways we can define um, each of the components and phases in this system. Well, we can define them each with a mole fraction, right? So you can basically write out a mole fraction for each of these components and phases, right? So what we'll have here um, is we will have a mole fraction right? And I'll use the subscript I. When I'm using the subscript I, I'm talking about the components. And when I use the variable N, I'm talking about the phases, right? So, um, so we can have a mole fraction, uh, chi I, right? And I'll put in parentheses N for a specific phase, right? So each individual phase and component has its own mole fraction, right? Now, uh, if we think about how many of these mole fractions we can have total, it's going to be C times P. So the total number of mole fractions that you have, so the total number of variables that we'll have of this type, right, are going to be C times P, right? So this is one part of determining the overall number of independent variables, right? You'll have a total number of mole fractions, which will be equal to the components times the phases, right? Now, we know that there's a, a restriction on the mole fraction, right? The mole fraction has to equal up to one, right? If you think back to our definition of the mole fraction, right? If it's going to, in order for it to be a complete description of a system, all of the mole fractions for each component must add up to equal one, right? So that means for each component, So for each uh, component and phase, right? So for each component, right? So for each component, we're going to have all of these summing up to equal one. So if we were to sum along that component, right? For that phase, that sum has to equal one, right? So how many of these do we have? Well, we're going to have one of these sums that will equal one for each individual phase, right? So we'll have P of these, right? So however many phases we have, we're going to have P amounts of these sums that equal up to one, right? So, uh, so we have this restriction as well, right? So we have, um, so we have this restriction of C times P, this number of, of different uh, components and phases we have, right? And we know that all of them should sum up to one. We'll have P of those types of restrictive sums for every single phase, right? Now, 
the what we just learned in the last video is that at equilibrium all phases must be equal all uh, chemical potentials must be equal right so since all uh chemical potentials are equal at equilibrium right so let me go to this color right so all mu our chemical potential are equal at equilibrium right so the chemical potential for each phase right so what does that mean that means for each component right so if we go to component one right let's say we have component one right and let's say we have a phase a that's going to be in equilibrium with the chemical potential of phase b which will be equal to the chemical potential of phase c right however many phases are in equilibrium at one time dot 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 all the way up to the total number of phases right and you can do this with the second component too right it'll have a phase a that'll be equal to a phase b dot 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 right all the way up to the total number of phases right and this is going to go on for however many components you have in the system right all the way down to the final component c it'll have a chemical potential that'll be equal to its phase b dot 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 all the way up to the last number of phases right so now how many of these equations how many of these individual equalities do we have right well we know that we'll have one of these um so we know that the phases are going to be equal for each component right so we know we'll have c of these lines of equations right and if we count the equal signs right on each line we'll have p minus one of each of those individual equalities right so we'll have c times p minus one so if we want to solve for the total number of independent parameters right so if we want to solve for our total number of independent variables f right it's basically going to be this c times p right because that's going to be all of the ways that we can classify our um our properties right via the mole fraction so we'll have c times p minus these restrictions that we have based on the property of the mole fraction and the chemical potential at equilibrium so we'll have minus p and then we'll have minus c p minus one right and we're going to add two right so this plus two is for temperature and pressure right so basically you always have to include some of these uh intensive variables about your system in order to describe the independent properties right so temperature and pressure are always included and then we have these restrictions based on um each of well, these uh properties based on the restrictions from the mole fraction and the chemical potential as well all right okay so now what we'll have here right so we'll have this c times p so i'm just going to call that cp right minus p minus cp right so uh distributing the c into the parentheses we'll have a negative cp plus c plus two and then so what you notice here is that we get some cancellation right so cp cancels with cp and then this just gives us our gibbs phase rule right so f our total number of independent parameters is just going to be c minus p plus two right so this is the gibbs phase rule right and so the reason that people refer to this uh derivation or this argument is so elegant right El for something to be elegant there has to be a certain element of simplicity to it right this really didn't involve any calculus it didn't involve any in-depth in physics or anything like that it was just a really simple elegant argument that describes the total number of independent variables that you can vary without disturbing the phase equilibrium and you just get it from simple relationships uh from thermodynamics so um so that's the gibbs phase rule